Okay, I think we should get started. Uh, we're a couple of minutes early, but uh, it sounds very, very quiet downstairs. So I think everybody's seated in a room. Uh, and I'll say sorry again for the seating. I'm going to try and get some more seating in here at the break. So hopefully if you come back after the break, we'll have chairs for you that are standing. I'm very sorry about the, the lack of accommodation. Uh, so my name's Ian Massingham. I lead a function at AWS on developer relations. We call it developer evangelism. Uh, it's really focused on developer effectiveness, trying to help developers uh, make best use of, use of the AWS platform. So that's what I and my team do. And quite a few of the speakers here today are from my group, both in the US and also here in Europe. Uh, and this is uh, AWS Dev Day. So it's a, a new event format. This is actually the third of four of these events that we're running here in Germany. Uh, what we're trying to do really is get away from the cycle of introductory content that AWS has become a little bit too focused on and try to do more uh, for customers that are already using the platform to try to help customers move beyond introductory use cases and get more value out of AWS. That's really the objective of this program. We've got four tracks here today. Obviously, you're sitting in the serverless track and watching the serverless track if you're watching this on video. Uh, and we're going to start with a piece of uh, content which is kind of introductory in nat nature, I'd say 200 to 300 level content. I'm just going to take a quick tour around some of the new announcements associated with serverless application architecture on AWS. And then we'll have a break at uh, 10.30. And then after 10.30, we're going to dive into more technical content. So we'll take a look at the developer experience for building serverless applications on AWS. Move on from that and talk about uh, architectural patterns for serverless. So what are common approaches that we, we see being used by customers? What are common combinations of services that we see being used to solve particular common use cases? So that'll just be for lunch, be just before lunch. And then after that, uh, we'll take a look at multi-region operations with DynamoDB Global Tables, which is a new service that we announced at, at reInvent that allows you to extend a non-relational database across the globe and have that available via multiple different endpoints in multiple different regions. And then we're going to wrap up in here later on with another talk, which will be at the intersection of data and serverless, which is about GraphQL. That will be delivered by, uh, by one of our, our customers uh, here in Germany. So that's the plan for the day. But all of the sessions from today will be available on the AWS YouTube channel after the event. So if you want to jump between tracks, maybe explore some of the topics, you'll still be able to catch up with what we cover in here on video. Okay, and there's actually a lot of AWS resources available on that YouTube channel. If you're not familiar with it, it's a really good place to go to find technical content. Uh, there's well over 400 sessions from AWS reInvent last year on that YouTube channel, including deep dives on everything that I'm going to cover in this first uh, in this first piece of content for you today. Okay, uh, want this to be interactive. Uh, so if you've got any questions, uh, you can throw your hand up during the session. I'll happily try and repeat your question back with video. Don't forget that. <laughs> and also uh, answer your questions uh, during the session. And if you've got follow-up, uh, you can find me on Twitter at Ian M with four M's, or you can uh, email me. It's just Ian M with one M at Amazon.com. Okay, so you can reach me there as well. Okay, so uh, let's just start off with a quick discussion of the problem that we were trying to solve uh, when we started thinking about uh, creating new types of services for developers that were using AWS. Okay, now we'd always always had services that move the majority of the burden for operations, scaling, deployment, and failure management to Amazon Web Services. If you think about services like DynamoDB, for example, it's a service that's been around a long time. It's a serverless data management service, like a serverless document-orientated database or a serverless key value store, depending on how you use it. Of course, there are machines there, in fact, special types of machines that are used to host all of the tables that customers establish within Dynamo. But in thinking about serverless delivery models, uh, what you should really be thinking about is, do I carry the burden of deploying, operating, scaling, and dealing with failures for any of the components, the underlying technology components associated with this service? Or do I just consume the service uh, directly as a developer or as a user without having to concern myself with, with what we always talk about as heavy lifting or undifferentiated heavy lifting associated with those operational activities. 
And what we're doing with uh, serverless is trying to tackle these challenges, scaling and making things easy for customers to manage and operate. Okay, so that's really what our goal is. With Dynamo, obviously, it's about data management. But with services like AWS Lambda and some of the other services that we're going to talk about later on in the day, it's about other things like uh, running custom code without having to worry about machines, operating systems, deployment, scaling, failure management, and all of those other activities. Or authentication with services like Amazon Cognito, where you want an ID provider, but you don't want to have to worry about deploying, scaling, operating, managing, and dealing with failures in the ID provider infrastructure. Or you want a queue or a mechanism for managing streaming data or one of these other low-level components that developers use over and over again. We're trying to turn them into services that you consume rather than things that you have to deploy and, management, deploy and manage. And I just hinted about what some of the benefits of doing that are. Uh, the first thing is it gives you time back that you can focus on other activities that are specific to your particular use case or the problem area within which you're working. This is one of the biggest benefits of using this kind of approach. It's about the things that you no longer have to do, okay, and how you can reclaim that time and, and reuse it on, on other activities that are more valuable for you. In scaling, uh, scaling works both ways, but you don't have to take action in order to initiate scaling. The systems are responsive to the level of usage that they see. The services are responsive to the level of usage that they see in both directions, both scaling up okay, and also in, in scaling down, and doing that in a responsive way, very efficient. Okay, and I'll talk about a case for that uh, in a second and also show you a demo that uses that case later on over in the, in the AI track. Uh, high availability, uh, both in the sense that you automatically take advantage of AWS availability management constructs. So I'm talking about things here like availability zones, hopefully means a lot to many of you that are using AWS today, and regions as well in some cases, the geographic locations around the world where we provide services. Services like uh, DynamoDB, AWS Lambda, SQS, SNS, the API gateway, they're all built on top of these primitives. So they inherit failure tolerant characteristics from the underlying infrastructure. If a machine or an availability zone fails, your AWS Lambda execution will not be interrupted. The next time you start another container, the next time you fire that function, it will automatically get invoked in one of the remaining availability zones, one of the remaining machines that is available to you. And as a developer or as a user, you'll see no impact and have to take no action in order to recover from failure. So that's a really important component. And then secondly, uh, you have no idle. You have elastic scaling in both directions. You have no idle. And as a result of having no idle, y you have no fixed costs. You know, you have you know, no carried costs that you would have if you were deploying onto EC2 where you've got a minimum fixed monthly charge of around three bucks for the smallest instance type that we have. Uh, you just don't have that with, with AWS Lambda. You have uh, no fixed costs, and the cost will be zero if you have no usage. And they'll scale up from there as you see usage and scale back down again when that drops away. I was over in uh, Singapore a couple of weeks ago for an AWS Summit event, which is obviously our large global developer education program. We're actually in Berlin with that event uh, at the beginning of June, so I hope some of you will join us there. And I was doing the closing keynote there, uh, and I had a demo that I was uh, showing which involves Amazon Lex. This is our conversational interface tool, enables you to build and deploy chatbots across a variety of different channels. I've done this demo a few times before uh, in the UK and also in Sweden, okay, where I've been doing actually events similar to this. And I've been seeing you know, an audience of maybe 100 or 200 people in front of me. When I got into this keynote in Singapore, I knew there would be between 2,000 and 4,500 people in the room. So the audience for the demo was roughly 10 times bigger than anything that I'd done before. What action did I need to take in order to scale the application to deploy it in front of that much larger audience? I had to raise a support ticket and I had to get my concurrency limit for my Lambda functions raised from 1,000 to 5,000 concurrent functions. 
which took about a day, and that was it. Other than that, I didn't have to take any action. I had nothing to deploy, nothing to scale. Uh, I actually used Twilio for a component of the service as well, for the elastic inbound and outbound SMS. And I had absolutely no, no changes to make to my code and no deployment actions to undertake either. Okay, so that really just illustrates this idea of scaling, built in, never pay for idle, and you have no infrastructure to provision, uh, manage, or to monitor. It was actually a very successful demo. Uh, and several hundred of the individuals in the audience interacted with the demo during the course of the session. Okay, and consistent performance, and I had no actions to take in order to, uh, in order to enable that. So it just proves that this model does work, uh, does work really well. Okay, so what are some of the new things that we've done to improve the developer experience for developers that are working with serverless over the course of the last few months? These are the, the next things that I want to focus on uh, during the course of this session. So who here has built something with AWS Lambda or with serverless approaches already? Okay, so I'd say just less than half of you. So for those of you that didn't put your hand up, this might be interesting, okay? This is about getting started and about finding examples of, of serverless, uh, of serverless applications. A lot of the uh, stuff that I learn, I learn by looking at other people's working code samples or looking at open source projects that other developers have worked on to implement solutions to similar problems to the one that I'm tackling. It's just I find that a really effective way to learn about new approaches, and I think a lot of developers do the same thing. Wh who learns by looking at other people's code finds that a really effective way? Yeah, everybody. Okay, okay. Who, who, uh, who has Stack Overflow open while they work? Come on, you guys should all be putting your hands up if you put your hands up to the first one. Surely that's where you look at other people's code, right? Okay, so uh, finding a working example is important, okay? And of course, a lot of uh, applications have already built, been built using this approach. Half the people have put their hand up and said they'd already built something using AWS Lambda and serverless approaches. Half of you didn't. So if we could get a mechanism for allowing new developers or developers that are new to this model to have easier access to applications that other people have built, wouldn't that be valuable? Wouldn't that be a helpful way to help people learn? And more than learning, uh, wouldn't it be cool if we just allowed developers that were interested in deploying applications using serverless approaches to discover those apps and deploy them directly into their AWS accounts so that they didn't just learn from other people's code, they could actually pick up and run other people's applications, other people's services that have been developed this way and deploy them straight into, uh, straight into their own AWS accounts. So that's what we're trying to tackle with this first new service. Uh, this just came out of beta into general availability a few weeks ago, and it's called the Serverless Application Repository. You can see it up here. This is the Create Function console, by the way, within the AWS Lambda Service console. So if you're logged into our console, you click on AWS Lambda, click on Create Function, which is the little blue button that you'll see on the top right of the console, you'll see this. And there are really three ways that you can get started with deployment now. There were two. The first one is author from scratch. So here I'll be dropped into a in-console co code editor that allows me to author a function directly from scratch with a very simple uh, Hello world example, written in a few different languages that I can use as a, a basis. It's helpful because it shows me how to deal with handling the event data that my function will receive when it is triggered. So how to access those important, uh, not really environment variables, but that data from the environment, okay? And the second way to deploy is by using these blueprints, okay? So these blueprints are pre-configured templates uh, which you can use as a starting point for your Lambda function. These are all managed and curated and maintained directly by AWS, the blueprints, okay? And again, if you come down to the Amazon Lex session that I'm going to be doing directly before lunch uh, later on downstairs in the AI track, you'll see this in action because I'm going to use blueprints as part of the demo down there, so you'll be able to see that. Uh, but we wanted to broaden out the ecosystem and make uh, more application types and more examples available to customers. We wanted to allow customers to share their own services and share their own code and applications directly within the user experience. So to enable that, we created something called the Serverless Application Repository, okay? And that gives you access to contributed examples of serverless apps directly within the AWS Lambda console. So it's like a catalog-based model for searching and discovering 
different application types. You can literally search for them by putting uh, search variables into this field here. You can do the same on blueprints, actually. So you can search here, and you'll get back matches underneath. So a stateless web app that stands up Amazon API Gateway APIs that handle requests processed by the Lambda functions of the app. Developed by Salman, probably butcher this name, Parchaha, maybe? And it's been deployed 15 times. So you can see the author and the popularity of, of the applications that you're choosing to deploy. And then you're dropped into a configuration dialog for that app, okay? And you can configure application-specific settings, and those will vary based upon the template uh, that, is being that has been defined and uploaded by the application creator, okay? And what we're using here is something called the Serverless Application Model, or SAM, okay? Uh, which is a CloudFormation extension DSL sits atop AWS CloudFormation and it offers up simplified abstractions for common serverless components. So if you want to deploy API gateway endpoints, for example, or you want to create very simple DynamoDB tables or you want to establish new Lambda functions, there are simplified definition models for those resource types within the SAM templating language. So it simplifies the process of creating the most common resources that are used by serverless application developers. That's really what SAM does. And you can see that we support expansion tokens here. These expansion tokens define the configuration questions that get asked when a user chooses to deploy an application that is defined in this way. Okay, So they'll be populated into the template, and that allows the deploying customer to customize the deployment for their particular use case. Just last week, last week, what's the date? The week before last, even, we announced that the SAM processing model, so the thing that converts from the SAM definition language to the cloud formation that underlies that, has been open sourced. So the transformation engine is now open source. Uh, it's on the AWS GitHub. You can obviously review the code that is used to effect, execute those transformations. And we also welcome a pull request to extend and enhance SAM for your specific uh, use case requirements as well. So that's something that customers have been asking for since we announced this last year. And uh, I think quite a popular launch. Okay. The definitions themselves have been open source for a long time, but now the transformation engine that implements those definitions is also available for you to inspect, to modify, and, and to contribute to as well. Okay, so uh, what we're trying to do here, make it easier for developers to search and browse ready-made apps and samples, giving you a library of open source apps that you can customize to get started with, enabling you to share both publicly and privately. So you can use this, obviously, into organization to share application templates publicly with the broad ecosystem of developers that are using the service. But also, a little bit like uh, Amazon Machine Images, if you've used EC2. Uh, I think, funny now, now we can say if you've used EC2, because we have quite a lot of customers using AWS that don't use EC2. A few years ago, that would have been a very unusual thing to say if you use EC2. If you use EC2, you'll know about image sharing, where I can create an Amazon machine image, like a gold master for a new virtual machine, and I can specify a list of account IDs and privately share that machine image just with that list of accounts. It's good for intra-organization sharing or for sharing software builds with specific entities. You know, maybe I've got a customer and I want to give them a beta of my software. Well, I could share an army to achieve that. You can do the same with, with serverless application repository. You can share privately with nominated accounts. So this can be a mechanism for creating and sharing code intra-organization, as well as externally between known or anonymous parties. Okay, so it's quite a, uh, a useful uh, mechanism. Can't directly monetize within the serverless application repository today, but you can build applications that have dependencies on APIs. Okay, and those APIs can, of course, be monetized. Uh, and you can sell access to APIs now through the AWS marketplace. So if you do have an API-based service, you could actually use the serverless application repository as a mechanism for reducing friction in onboarding. Say I am a payment provider like Stripe, for example, and I want to make it really easy for my customers to integrate my payment engine into their serverless apps. One approach that I could take would be to build a Stripe serverless application using SAR 
civil suffocation repository and allow other AWS customers to provision that access application directly within to the into their AWS account. So if you do have services that are expressed using APIs, this can be a friction reduction mechanism for onboarding new customers where you don't just provide an SDK, but you provide a complete app, a complete service for access to your service, wi which customers can deploy natively inside their own AWS account. Okay, so there's a lot of opportunities there, uh, I think, uh, for developers to use this in an interesting way. Uh, some real examples of things that have been built, just to give you a flavor. Looking at this, one thing that I discovered is image conversion <laughs> services, like format conversion services, seem to be a very popular use case, like PNG to JPEG or TIFF to JPEG and resizing services as well. So there's lots and lots of stuff there that developers obviously using as components of their apps and they've packaged them up and made them available via this model. So there's lots of stuff. I'd really advise you to jump on the console and just take a look at what's there. And if you've got great ideas, either share them natively or try to find other developers to collaborate with you, maybe build an open source project and then push the output of your open source project into, into the serverless application repository as a mechanism for making it available. I think it's an interesting tool to use in that way as well. Okay, so that's serverless application repository. Uh, some other things that we've done. We've dramatically improved the editor that is present inside the AWS Lambda console. Uh, and we'll see m you'll see a lot more of this in action if you come to the next session after the break, which is the serverless developer experience session. We'll actually do a demo of this. Uh, this is uh, something called the Cloud9 IDE, which is a fully featured IDE that we announced at AWS reInvent last year. A version of that is available natively within the Lambda console as an embedded editor. So it has syntax highlighting, uh, capability to edit files within the deployment package beyond the entry point function, the original handler function, and a lot of other uh, enhanced features as well. So that really improves the developer experience for people that want to edit natively within the console. There's also integration between AWS Lambda and uh, another service we have called CodeStar, okay, which is our pipelines service, our continuous integration, continuous deployment service. Yeah. Yeah, so the question is about continuous updates of applications that are deployed through the application repository and also security, I think, is what you're driving at, verification through curation. So the answer on the first one is no. Once you deploy, then you're taking a copy of that application, creating an instance of it essentially within your account, and it's something that you then edit and control from that point forward. So you can't sort of change the master branch and have that reflected through into your production environment. So that's not possible okay on the on the curation yes there is curation but we're obviously not warranting the code so we are providing validation of the code okay and looking it over but we're not guaranteeing that it's free from bugs or from vulnerabilities so you need to verify it as well No, no, no. And of course, you can see exactly what they are doing by looking at the SAM template. You can see all of the resources that are created, the Lambda functions themselves that are being established have been pushed into your account, and you can inspect them You know, using either the inline editor or downloading those packages to evaluate them with an IDE. No, they can do that as well. They can do that as well. So the SAM template can include both the simplified resources and it can also include full-blown cloud formation. So they can do anything that a cloud formation template can do, which is a lot of things. And this is one of the reasons that we do the light touch verification, but you should, al you should also do the verification. Uh, what I would recommend is that you do the deployments in a sandbox account, first of all, before you bring them into your production account. And then you'll be able to see exactly what resources get created. Okay. That's how I would tackle it if I was considering bringing this code into a production environment or into an environment where there was production data, actually. Yeah. Okay. So, 
yeah, so an enhanced editor experience is something else that we've been working on, okay? Uh, some other things as well. So uh, concurrency, we'll talk about concurrency a little bit more later, okay? But we have uh, introduced a mechanism for auto-approving concurrency requests, increased concurrency requests. You get a thousand concurrent executions across all Lambda functions within each region where you deploy them, okay, as default within your account. So I can have, like in my example I gave before, if a thousand of the people in that audience of two and a half thousand had all interacted with the chatbot concurrently within the same, say, 50 millisecond period, and that's quite unlikely, but if they had done that, my account would have capped with a thousand concurrent executions of my Lambda function, and I would have got a invocation error appearing in my CloudWatch logs and also in my metrics showing me that I'd hit the cap, and my concurrent invocations metric in CloudWatch would have flatlined a thousand. Okay, that's what would happen, okay? Now, I raised a ticket through our internal system, which we call fleet management, uh, actually very similar to a limit increase that you can do through the support console, and within a couple of days, I had my 5,000 limit. Actually, it's easier for external customers, okay? If you go and request a limit increase to 3,000, we have an automated scoring system that will assess your account, okay? And if you're s assessed as a low-risk account, you'll automatically get approved for 3,000 concurrent in each region that you specify, and it is done on a per-region basis, okay? So then you can run up to 3,000 concurrent functions. Customers often ask why we have these limits if they're auto-approved for increase. So why do we have the limits if they're auto-approved for increase? Well, many AWS limits are there to protect customers from misconfiguration or costs that might arrive for arise from misconfiguration. So the reason the limit there really is for your protection rather than for ours, okay? And we want customers to consciously evaluate their usage needs and ask us to raise the limit so that if you have code that misbehaves and you end up driving a lot of concurrent executions by mistake, you don't end up with a big AWS bill. We want to protect you from that. And that's why a lot of our, our service limits are actually in place, uh, especially soft limits. They're really in place to protect customers from overrunning usage, okay? Uh, so automatic approval to three times the default, and you can go up to lots, lots more than that. I know of customers that have got limits in the high tens of thousands of concurrency and beyond, actually. So you can drive a lot of functions if your use case warrants it. If you ask for something like that, you'll get a call or a discussion with one of our solutions architects. Again, for the same reason, really, that I mentioned before, it's about trying to ensure that customers are using the platform in the most cost-efficient way possible. Okay, so we'll try to give some guidance to help you contain your costs, try to offer some mechanisms that you might want to use in order to drive down constrain the amount of usage that you have, okay? Kind of counterintuitive for customers often to hear that from us, but we actually want customers to spend as little as possible on AWS <laughs> because we think if you do that, you'll end up being more successful over the longer term and therefore using more of our stuff than if we allow you to burn through a lot of budget on our platform. Uh, cold start. So this is an area of concern for customers that are using AWS Lambda within uh, applications that are latency sensitive. So it might be applications where Lambda calls are blocking for the UI, so users can see when AWS Lambda is being invoked. Maybe it's to call an API to deliver some dynamic content into a web page, or maybe it's part of a transaction flow with a customer, maybe delivering a push notification or something to move a customer onto the, the next part of a transaction flow. Uh, we all know there's lots of data points out there that suggest that latency reduces user satisfaction. And there's actually some really good studies that have been done by a lot of large internet companies about how latency affects customer lifetime value or propensity to buy and other things as well. So keeping latency down, it's much uh, advantageous in many different ways, right? We had a challenge here, particularly with customers that had very large deployment bundles for their functions. Okay. Often customers that had developed Lambda functions in Java okay, included a lot of pre-compiled classes and ended up with deployables that were you know, hundreds of megabytes or larger in size. What do you think actually happens under the hood when you first invoke a Lambda function? Does anybody know what happens under the hood when you first invoke a Lambda function for the first time or for the first time in a while? Why does it take a long time though? Yeah. 
Yeah. So the response here is that the JVM is fired up and that these classes have to be loaded. But there's something before that actually, which is when you trigger the function, a container has to get deployed into the execution environment that contains the JVM and that contains the code associated with it. So each uh, Lambda runtime that we produce is effectively a base container image. Okay? And each piece of function code that you deploy is a new container which is built from that base image ready for invocation the first time you get an event. And the first time you get an event, we get the container from our repository, internal repository, and we stage it down onto a machine so that it can be deployed with the resources that are required, namely a CPU, some memory, <laughs> some disk, and a bus to connect those resources together, which is a computer, of course, and that's when your code starts to execute and you start to get results. Uh, so that's why the cold start happens, because that container has to move across the network from the repository onto the execution host. Once it's there, it's there, and subsequent requests, well, they're handled much, much more quickly. It's already resident. Until the cache TTL expires, if it's not been used for a while, it gets destaged, and then the next time you fire it, you have the cold start again. And if you have a lot of functions running, tens or hundreds or thousands, you don't just see one cold start. You see a new cold start each time a new machine gets provisioned to deal with scale out. Each time the container lands onto a new machine, you'll see one function that takes longer than all the rest. Okay, So that's just how the service works. So we've optimized now internally within our infrastructure to try to reduce that. We're not disclosing what techniques we're using for that, but given what I've just described, you can probably guess what a few of the techniques are that we're using to minimize the time that it takes to get those containers down onto the machines in response to invocation actions. Yeah. 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 You don't have to do anything. Okay. You don't have to do anything. You'll just, if you were using Lambda before AWS reInvent with large functions and you're using it now and you compare the impact of the cold starts, they're still there. Okay. It's just they're up to 80% smaller now. So what might have taken a second before might take 200 milliseconds now. Okay. So that is an uh, implicit uh, optimization that we've done to the platform. This is one of the nice features, of course, of using the cloud, using a service provider like AWS. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to re-engineer anything in order to get that. W we've obviously received feedback from customers, and working on that feedback, we're trying to optimize the platform. So you'll see that. Particularly relevant if you are including a lot of dependencies within your deployable package, either statically compiled binaries or lots and lots of Java classes, bytecode. That's uh, where the problem normally manifests. Logging. This is a user experience improvement. If you jump into the AWS console for Lambda now, look at monitoring, you can directly jump through into the CloudWatch logs console to access logs for a specific function without an intermediary step. Okay, so it's user experience improvement for uh, making it simpler to, to access logs. That's something we've done. We've also increased uh, the maximum memory footprint for uh, Lambda functions as well, from 1.5 gigs up to 3 gigs. And there's a very, this is really important because with AWS Lambda, the dial you twist or the slider you move is the amount of memory that is allocated to the function. Okay, but the probably one of the most important best practices that you need to know about in using AWS Lambda is that all resources scale in proportion to the amount of memory that you allocate. So by moving that slider up or twisting that dial and allocating more memory, you're also giving more CPU shares, you're giving more network throughput, and you're also allocating more sockets and other, net and other host resources as well. So everything scales in accordance with the amount of memory that is allocated. So when we say we're giving three gigs of RAM, we're also doubling the maximum amount of CPU that can be provided and doubling the maximum amount of network throughput. So we're basically creating a twice as big Lambda function machine on all resource vary all resource axes, all resource vectors. Okay, so just more horsepower for computationally intensive computationally intensive tasks. In the responsive use case, like the microservices use case, where you're building API logic into Lambda functions. This is not a huge, huge issue for most customers, okay? Because mostly they are building really, really small services that have a 
kind of simple footprint and don't drive a lot of CPU. But consider things like uh, encapsulating machine learning inference models inside Lambda functions or building serverless map reduce processes where you want to do large scale data processing within Lambda functions. That's where these capabilities are particularly relevant. Okay, so you can have very big models for inference. Uh, you can have very computationally intensive inference operations, or you can load large amounts of data into each function for data processing operations. It gets very valuable when you consider those use cases. Okay. Uh, and then finally, <laughs> uh, we also have these two things. These came a little bit later. This was in January. AWS Lambda support for uh, C Sharp with .NET Core 2.0 and AWS Lambda support for Golang as well. Uh, so these are essentially new container types that have been made available for developers that include the relevant JVMs and in this case uh, include the capability for you to invoke uh, Lambda functions that are written in Go. Anyone familiar with the AWS X-Ray? Minority of people. This is our distributed tracing tool. You can embed the X-Ray SDK within your application, typically your Lambda-based application, and then you can gather statistics uh, at the individual invocation level or the at the aggregate level about performance of your code. So it allows you to embed instrumentation inside your Lambda functions for observability. We also have X-Ray support for Go and X-Ray support for, for C-Sharp. C-Sharp is in beta. Uh, so that gives you the same observability on these two uh, runtime environments that you have on Python, JavaScript, and Java. Okay, so we're fi filling out the, the ecosystem. And we also have some local support for both of these as well, which enables you to run Lambda functions and other uh, serverless resources on your development machine in the same way that you might run them in AWS. Okay, so uh, next area of improvement is about the developer experience as it pertains to uh, kind of wrapping around functions that make it easier for developers to safely develop and deploy code and to be more productive. Okay? Uh, the first thing here is AWS Cloud9, which I mentioned earlier, which is a version of which is embedded directly within the Lambda console for, cold for code editing, but which is also a standalone service. Okay, so you can jump onto the AWS console, you can provision a Cloud9 workspace for you or for other members of your team. Okay? Uh, and then you have a web-based IDE uh, that you can use for uh, code authoring, debugging. Uh, what actually happens under the covers is a EC2 instance gets provisioned for you, and on the EC2 instance is installed the IDE. Uh, and the fact that you have an EC2 instance underlying this means that you have uh, a Linux console experience as well as the IDE available to you. In fact, the Linux console experience is embedded natively within the IDE. So you'll see a multi-pane layout of the type you'll be familiar with. One of the panes is the code editor. Another one of the panes is the code explorer that allows you to explore all of the different resources within your package and the or within your application. And then the third pa pane is a Linux, Linux console experience command line that you can use for interacting with source control systems uh, and that you can also use to manipulate, customize, and configure the underlying host okay, for testing purposes, for example. We support breakpoints on uh, JavaScript. Uh, we support SAM local, which, as I mentioned earlier, is our local say emulation environment, a local, locally deployable version of API gateway endpoints and Lambda function runtime plus a DynamoDB emulator. Okay, so you can build a serverless app using SAM, deploy it locally onto your laptop or locally into the IDE, remotely but locally into the IDE, and you can use that for local testing, IDE debugging. It allows you to do things like configure test events, send those payloads to your API endpoints, and then observe the results that you get back. Okay, so stuff like that's built in. Also has Lambda, bl Lambda Blueprint support built in, uh, and it's easy to use. The other, uh, what I consider to be one of the killer features for this is the collaborative coding feature. So you can work, if you know Google Docs, or one that I prefer, Quip, which is a Salesforce tool for collaborative document editing, which we use a lot within uh, Amazon and AWS. 
you can work concurrently on the same document, right? So it's not version control where you check in and check out. It's I'm editing a doc and you're editing a doc. I can see your cursor and you can see mine. Yeah? We have the same thing in the IDE. So we can both edit the same source file concurrently. I can see what you're doing and you can see the bugs that I'm introducing. Uh, and it's for distributed pair programming or distributed squad programming where you want a team of developers working concurrently on the same code base. We support that natively within within the editor. It's actually a really, <laughs> really nice feature. Uh, if you're bad like me at writing software, your expert team members can act as a crutch for you. It's <laughs> pretty much what happens in my group. <laughs> so, yeah, that's it. It's, uh, it's really nice. Uh, experiment with it if you haven't tried it. It costs like, I want to say around $6 a month per user to provision. It's very cost effective. Uh, CICD processes. So, I just talked about uh, CodeStar before. I'd say that CodeStar is probably the quickest, quickest and easiest way to get started with new AWS projects that you're considering running. Just say I want to host a web service or a website and I want to do that serverless. I can jump onto the CodeStar console, click the project type that I want. So I want a serverless web application delivered using Flask, let's say. Click that, click deploy. Five minutes later, I'll have a source code repository with the tem template code in it for the sample app. I'll have a build pipeline configured and deployment endpoints configured, and I'll have a first copy of my application running. Okay? And then I have a full automated CI CD pipeline that I can use. Check the or clone the source repository down onto my machine or into my Cloud9 environment, edit the source, check it back in again, and a minute or two later, I'll have a new version of my app in production. So it establishes the complete tool chain that you need to manage and deploy software in a team. I can establish additional users and they can work on the same resources using the version control system. We can immediately start to collaborate on developing and enhancing this app. It's so easy to get started with. I just, you know, I think it will become the default model for new, new users of AWS. And we have integration there for serverless apps, as I've just described, uh, with a variety of different project templates. So from Express uh, through to Flask, through to Java-based deployment models, and some new ones for Golang as well. So if you haven't experimented with CodeStar, just take a look at it. Uh, it's a really uh, easy way to get started with, uh, with these services in, in aggregate. Uh, but once you get into more complex environments, Customers have uh, more requirements. And we've also made some enhancements here to try to simplify and improve the deployment model for, for customers that are using API Gateway and Lambda as a mechanism for running production apps. Okay. Production apps obviously have customers or users attached to them, and that means they need to be managed in a different way. Right? We need more rigor, more discipline, and more controls around how we choose to do deployment. Okay. So these are some of the enhancements that we've introduced. First is weighted aliases. Uh, if I wanted to have uh, A-B testing or blue-green deployments for my API endpoints previously, how would I do that? I'd use DNS more than likely, right, with weighted record sets where 5% of my DNS requests get resolved down onto endpoint A and 95% get resolved down onto endpoint B. And then when I've established that endpoint A is the endpoint that I want to promote to production, I change the weighting so that 100% goes there. Okay? And if I'm lucky, people respect the DNS TTL that I've specified. And five minutes later, all of my customers are over on endpoint A rather than on endpoint B, which was my prior version. Right? And it always works that way, right? No. <laughs> because DNS gets cached, some applications won't respect the TTL I've specified or some resolvers won't respect the TTL that I've specified and I'll end up with less specific control over the traffic migration okay? and I might end up with some clients that have a hangover of the old endpoint present in their cache and they get error messages or break when I cut over to the new app. This is why DNS based uh, Traffic distribution is not perfect. It's good, okay, but it's not perfect. So to help improve upon that, we've introduced weighted aliases. 
This allows me to have one API endpoint, which all of my clients have all the time, always resolve to that one API endpoint. But then behind the API endpoint, I actually invoke different Lambda functions with different weightings. So I have 95% of my traffic hitting function version prod and 5% of my traffic hitting function version beta. Okay? And then when I decide I want to do my cutover, I put 100% of my traffic onto function version beta and nobody has to change anything in DNS. The traffic just shifts across. It also allows me to use function execution waiting in, no in non-DNS based endpoints. Because this is for event-driven applications, right? Some of the events are coming from API gateways, but some of the events might be coming from other sources, like my Lexbot or my Kinesis stream where I'm processing records in real time, or my uh, IoT rules engine. Okay, these are internal AWS event sources that do not use DNS. They directly invoke a Lambda function. So I can't do waiting across them without this feature. With this feature, I can do waiting across these internal event sources as well. So I can do A-B testing in my data pipeline or A-B testing in my IoT application as well as A-B testing in my DNS resolved exposed endpoints. A lot more use cases become open. Okay. Uh, the same on API Gateway, we can do this with substages. This means that API Gateway endpoints that aren't serviced by Lambda functions can also benefit from the same kinds of features. Say I'm serving some or all of my API namespace from EC2 instances that run custom code rather than from Lambda. Well, with these substages, I can share traffic across those two different destinations, which might be two different EC2 autoscaling groups as well. Okay, so more granular and specific and accurate control over my API gateway traffic as well. Okay, and then we've also introduced automated support for safe serverless deployments. So this is using our code deploy service, integrating code deploy with metrics, CloudWatch metrics. So I can do things like push a candidate release into prod using uh, code deploy observe the error rates on that candidate release and if those error rates exceed a predefined threshold that I define, maybe 3%, I can automatically roll out to the prior version, so roll forward to the prior version. Okay, So have this automated mechanism again. It's about enabling smaller development teams particularly to achieve higher levels of reliability by automating aspects of the deployment process and allowing them to use rules-based deployments. Rules-based roll forward, rules-based roll forward. Okay, This is how it looks in the console okay, with traffic shifting. And you see that our traffic gradually gets moved over onto the new version of our app. And if we had an error message, errors appearing there, we could roll back from that. This is uh, Canary deployments in the API gateway. See we're specifying here how many percentage of requests we want to put on our canary. We're using the stage balancing in the API gateway here. So that canary could be a new Lambda function or it could be a new autoscaling group with a new endpoint code running on it. Okay, We've got flexibility as to what's behind this part of the namespace. And then we can observe traffic shifting and see our metrics in uh, the CloudWatch console here, you can see it here. So our 10% on our canary equates to 113 requests. Our 90% on prod is nine times that roughly. Okay. I'm going to talk now about uh, AWS Lambda in enterprises or serverless approaches in enterprises. Uh, one of the things we heard a lot from customers was we want to integrate serverless Lambda-based applications with pre-existing data sources that we've got in the enterprise. You know, We've got data in our relational data stores or inside our corporate VPCs or our corporate network. Uh, they can't be exposed to the public internet, but we still want business logic that's encoded within Lambda functions to be able to access that data. So we can maybe open up new interaction channels for customers that use the rich data sets that we have, but expose them via APIs for web or mobile apps in a more scalable, reliable, uh, cost optimal way. So they want to combine Lambda with existing resources. Okay. So to solve for that, uh, 
we've done quite a bit of things on legacy connectivity, okay? There's a couple of areas here that are interesting. Maybe the least obvious one is allowing customers to defend themselves from the effects of launching publicly available apps that rely on legacy data stores, okay? Where your licensing might be constrained. Perhaps you've got a license deployed on your legacy RDBNS system that caps the number of concurrent connections that you can make to it, or where your vendor is gonna charge you punitive pen penalties if you exceed the number of concurrent connections. So it's not so much that they want to limit you, it's just that they want to charge you. Okay, so mechanisms for, that's never happened, right? This guy at the front's smiling, I'm sure it's happened to him. <laughs> so <laughs> we, uh, yeah, concurrency control is really important. Second thing is uh, VPC is a security construct that customers trust, you know, that customers have verified many, many times and that many customers have built compliance or privacy positions around, okay? So they don't want to breach that. They don't want to pull down the walls of the castle just because they need to get to the resources that are protected by those walls. You know, they want a mechanism for controlled access, okay? Maybe establishing trust zones where Lambda functions run within the walls, okay, and can access those resources and pass the results out in a secure way. And then thirdly, on auditing, okay? So specific customer feedback that we were hearing. Uh, it's, all, it's stuff like this. Control, concurrency, uh, allowing functions to be run with very low concurrency for development purposes and then unthrottled when they're designated as prod, okay? Or temporarily disabling functions. And what that really boils down to is that concurrency control, really important, okay? So to help with that, uh, we've done a few things. First of all is exposing concurrency metrics within CloudWatch logs. So you can see now within the CloudWatch console with those graphical metrics, how many copies of each particular function are running concurrently. So you have visibility, first of all, right? The second thing is you can apply per function concurrency throttles, okay? So quickly modify the config configuration of a specific function to set an enforced concurrency limit for that particular function. Okay, so this allows me to solve a few of those problems. Limit concurrency to legacy systems to protect functions from being drowned out, really, by other functions that are being overrun. Okay, so we can limit less business critical functions, for example, or functions that do not directly impact the customer experience. Okay, and then allow those functions to get throttled as other functions consume the available aggregate limit that we have within our account. We can set a function limit to zero, which will temporarily disable that function as a very quick atomic operation. Okay, so just switch that function off without deleting it or de uh, destaging it, okay? And then we can uh, develop functions that have limited billing and runaway protection as well. So there's lots and lots of different use cases that can be solved uh, through this capability of uh, concurrency control, particularly important in enterprise. And then on the API gateway, we've got a couple of enhancements here that are relevant for enterprises as well. Uh, VPC private link. This is a mechanism, a standard mechanism for establishing connectivity to VPC-based resources. Okay, uh, and it can be used in several different ways. In the context of the API gateway, the way it can be used is to securely tunnel from a public API endpoint to a load balancer within a VPC. Okay, so I could specify part of my API namespace, my public API namespace, so these endpoints are public, okay? Then I can wire that back directly to a specific network load balancer within a specific VPC without exposing the network load balancer to the general internet or without using security groups. Okay, so I'm using the programmable network platform that AWS operates to establish private connectivity from the edge locations or from a region-specific endpoint directly into a VPC 
to a network load balancer behind which I can place obviously an array of EC2 instances in an auto scaling group that service that particular part of the namespace. And I can do that in a secure way where neither the network load balancer or the instances are otherwise exposed to the internet. And those resources needn't necessarily be in AWS. The network load balancer needs to be in AWS, but the resources could be at the end of a direct connect connection in my own private data center. Okay, so I can thread connectivity through the cloud back to a specific point abstracting behind that network load balancer. Very useful for high security API services. Okay, and then on the regional endpoints, I just mentioned so either from the broadly distributed API gateway endpoints, which are operating over 100 different locations around the world atop our CloudFront infrastructure endpoints, or uh, new. Uh, region-specific API endpoints that we're now providing. So you can specify that you want an API endpoint in Frankfurt, for example. Okay, Your customers will reach that API endpoint in Frankfurt. That might be served by Lambda functions that are running in Frankfurt. So your data is going to be localized to Germany the whole time. Or they might be served by private link resources, which could also be running inside VPCs that were located within Frankfurt as well. So you're able to scope down where your data flows keep it within specific regions, region being a geographic location within which AWS provides services, of course. Okay. Here in Europe, Dublin, London, Frankfurt, and Paris, with .com to come, and more uh, to come in the future, I'm sure, as well. Is this a question? No? Okay. This is how you set it up. So VPC links. This is in the API gateway console. I'm going to create a VPC link, okay, which specifies a specific network load balancer that you can see here, okay, and your integration type is VPC. Very simple. This creates the threading that I described, the channel I described from the API gateway to those VPC-based resources. And then what you end up with is a, a matrix of solutions. We used to only have internet to internet with the existing service. By opening up these two other models, the regional AWS service, you can have your region optimized endpoints. And to the customer VPC, you have private VPC or region endpoints plus private VPC available to you. This is done with that private link service that I mentioned a second ago. And then on logging and audit, uh, a few different things here. Structured logging for APIs, so uh, making it easier for you to search and index API requests discover them, troubleshoot issues, manage traffic uh, at the layer seven point in the stack. Uh, and also uh, CloudTrail support for Lambda functions. So this enables you to have, familiar with CloudTrail? Anyone not? Well, I'll say anyway, it's an auditing service that allows you to record all AWS API requests made using identities associated with specific account. So you'll, if you turn it on, and it's turned on by default for all customers for seven days, you can also turn on extended retention. You're then able to go back and verify, observe, inspect, query uh, operations that have taken place within your account. So it's good for uh, incident remediation. It's good for security forensics operations if your account's been breached and you want to know how which credentials, where from. That data will be tied up in CloudTrail for a period of seven days by default. You can inspect it. Uh, very useful. We have uh, Lambda function invocation within CloudTrail as well. So if you are invoking Lambda function synchronously or asynchronously directly using our API, that that will be recorded in your CloudTrail logs now. So you'll be able to see uh, who's done what, when, and where from. OK, so that pretty much wraps it up. A uh, lot of focus on serverless for enterprise use cases. When we started with this back in, when was it? 2015? Lambda, I think, yeah? Uh, you know, as usual, the early adopters were in startups that were building brand new products. But the benefits case for using Lambda is very compelling inside larger enterprises as well. And we've seen customers like Capital One and actually a lot of other customers uh, really accelerate ahead with Lambda and want to use it for a lot more use cases. And a lot of the recent work that we've been doing in improving the fit for AWS Lambda in the enterprise has come from feedback that we've received from customers like that. So if you've looked at Lambda before and you've thought uh, it's not a fit for security compliance or privacy reasons, 
uh, I'd encourage you to take another look based on what you've seen today. And of course, uh, stay in this track for the rest of the day and learn a little bit more about the technical detail of some of the things that I've covered uh, during this first session. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Yes. So the question is about CloudFormation service coverage, right? The fact is that there is a lag between new services getting introduced and often new features getting introduced and support for those new services and features arriving within CloudFormation. Uh, a couple of things to say about that. There is a lag, but the lag is reducing. So we're generally getting better at delivering those coverage features in a more timely manner. Uh, the second thing to say is, there's been some changes within AWS and Amazon as to how those new services and features have CloudFormation support delivered for them. And those changes should continue to compress that time. So you know, it should continue to go down and get closer to immediate. Okay? And then the final thing to say is you can use Lambda functions to create custom resource types. Okay? which bridge those gaps yourselves if you wish to do so. And of course, you can open source those and contribute them to the community. It's not necessarily the answer that you'll want to hear because it's taking on heavy lifting that we should probably be doing. But if you've got a really pressing need and you desperately need coverage for some resource that isn't there, you can do it in that way. And there are lots of examples out there of custom resource resources that have been created by other customers that you can basically reuse. So I, I'd encourage you to do that. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, I'll say thank you again. Uh, we've got a break now until 11. Uh, and after 11, it's serverless developer experience. So we'll take a look at Cloud9 and some of the tools that I've talked about with some demos in this room. Obviously, you're free to visit the other tracks as well if you wish to do so. Thanks again. <laughs>